Welcome, this is the fourth set of lectures. This one uh, we're going to be covering both an introduction to the uh, four or five different types of uh, fuel cells and uh, we're also going to look at uh, how you calculate the open circuit voltage and we're going to put that in such a way that you can see the similarity between how you calculate the open circuit voltage between all the different types of fuel cells. Okay, uh, just as a review what we did uh, in the last lecture uh, we worked out the exergy balance equation, which is shown at the very, very bottom, um, for a steady state fuel cell system. What you have is the amount of uh, electrical work you can get out of the fuel cell is equal to the sum of the exergy flowing into the system, um, where in this case N sub I is um, negative for stuff that's uh, exiting the system. And you can see here there's a term for thermal energy uh, that enters is the, the heat entering Q dot. Um, that'd be a summation if you have heat coming in uh, at different um, locations, perhaps at different temperatures. T here is the temperature at which uh, the heat is entering. And, and then we have um, the minus T naught times sigma dot irreversible. And this was the exergy destruction term. It's uh, how much work is lost due to ir irreversible processes. So what you do, if you know the exergy flowing in, uh, and if you've somehow calculated what's going on inside, and you know the exergy of what's leaving, um, it's pretty straightforward. You just have to use the exergy, uh, molar exergy flows that we've um, already shown in the last lecture. So what we're going to do uh, here is we're going to look at, um, first of all, what, what are uh, electrochemical reactions, um, and then start working our way into how do you calculate the, the open circuit voltage in, inside of a fuel cell. Okay, so the generally speaking for electrochemical reactions, you're going to have a cathode and an anode uh, separated by some kind of electrolyte, and uh, at the cathode, which is where, um, in our case, reduction is taking place. Uh, at the cathode, you have electrons going from the electrode to a, spe um, a species. So this could be oxygen. And uh, we say that the oxygen gets reduced. And um, so that you're familiar, um, I'll, I'll, I'll go through why the, the words reduced and oxidized come from. But let me switch over now to the other side, to the anode. We, um, anode is where oxidation is occurring and this means an electron is leaving a gas or a liquid molecule and it's going to the electrode. So we say that the fuel is being oxidized. The fuel, maybe let's say hydrogen, loses an electron uh, and loses it to the electrode. Um, the, ele the electrode eventually goes through your power source, your, power, your load your load so you can generate the say electricity to power something and then it's going to be going through to your cathode. The terms uh, reduction and oxidation uh, go back to the metals industry. When we say that something is reduced what we mean is that it the charge becomes less uh, positive. So a lot of times we'll say iron 2 or iron 3. Iron 2 meaning that it's in a plus 2 state and iron 3 meaning it's in it's a plus 3 state. When it, be when it becomes reduced, you're reducing iron from iron 2 or iron 3 to, let's say, iron metal. And that's a form of iron gets reduced. And that's actually where the term reduction is coming from. Um, if iron gets oxidized, it's going, let's say, from its metal form to... Uh, metallic form, which would be FEZ, it's a plus zero state. Uh, it's going to either uh, Fe plus two or Fe plus three, and you say it gets oxidized. Because really what's happening is in some sense it's being combining with oxygen to form iron oxides. Okay, so this is a general electrochemical reaction. Um, specifically for fuel cell, um, we have a similar thing going on, and um, in any type of fuel cell, electrochemical cell, y your, the overall reaction is split into two half cell reactions. So what we have for um, 
on the anode would be hydrogen oxidation in which hydrogen gets turned into two protons and two electrons and at the cathode we have what's called oxygen reduction and so two two protons and two electrons and then oxygen go to uh, water either liquid or water vapor and so this is our primary concept which we've shown um, now I'm going to start going through some of the different uh, cases you'll see um, and the first one we're going to cover is the proton exchange membrane fuel cell um, it's also the PE is sometimes used to stand for polymer electrolyte sometimes it's stood to mean proton exchange I think e either of them are pretty interchangeable at this point in time what we have is uh, it's a polymer polymer membrane with acidic groups uh, sulfuric acid groups chemically bonded into the polymer and uh, when the polymer is saturated with water the protons um, go into the liquid making a high pH solution um, leaving behind the acidic the acidic group with um well, with without the proton and so the the key thing here is that the polymer solution when it, there's plenty of water around can conduct protons and it doesn't conduct electrons which is important because that electrolyte should not be able to conduct electrons the electrons should be forced to go through the external load and if they don't if they can go through the polymer if polymer could somehow conduct protons and electrons you basically just have a short circuit and you can never develop any voltage so in this case we'll have uh, hydrogen as we've already discussed hydrogen comes into the anode and oxygen goes into the cathode and what the water is leaving out the cathode in a polymer exchange um, proton exchange membrane fuel cell we're now going to dis discuss alkaline fuel cells and um, alkaline fuel cells can be s somewhat similar to the um, proton exchange polymer polymer membrane fuel cells because uh, you can build them where they are polymer membranes but instead of using sulfuric acid groups that are chemically bonded into the polymer you'd use um, basic groups that are uh, basic that lead to a high pH um, this could be amines like um, ammonia like compounds that are chemically bonded into the polymer in this case you won't be conducting protons you'll be conducting uh, OH radicals or not OH uh, minus which is an uh, hydroxide a hydroxide ion and uh, this case instead of um, the, the proton would go from the anode to the cathode in this case because it's a negatively charged species it's going from the cathode to the anode and um, another way instead of doing a polymer membrane would sometimes used is a porous ceramic material that they'd be filled with potassium hydroxide such that the pores are small enough that um, capillary forces can keep the potassium hydroxide in the pores and keep it from escaping um, but I think we're seeing more and more that these ceramic matrix polymer um, are being replaced by polymer membranes in, in this type of application so here what you'd have um, on the anode you'd have hydrogen combining and reacting with two hydroxide ionic species uh, that's producing two moles of water and two electrons electrons going around to the load and then are combining with oxygen and water on the cathode side to, to, to create the hydroxide um, hydro hydroxide species that go across the electrolyte Okay, now we're going to start getting into some of the higher temperature fuel cell systems. Uh, the first of which is a solid oxide fuel cell. Um, here we're using a non porous ceramic electrolyte that conducts oxide ions. It's uh, oxygen with a doubly charged negative. Uh, the electrodes themselves are going to be porous, and it's on the anode side, it'll be a, the porous. Um, 
YS, normally it's YSZ is the oxide uh, that conducts the oxide, uh, is the ceramic that conducts the oxides. And then on the cathode, the catalyst type material is, is a ceramic that's called LSM or LSCF. Depends. There's various ones, but those are uh, some of the more typically used materials. Um, so you don't have platinum being used in solid oxide fuel cells for the most case. Um, what you have is nickel on the anode and some kind of um, lengthenum material being used on the uh, cathode. And so here it's pretty simple. Um, hydrogen is coming into the anode and gets converted into water. Um, and the ox oxygen is, you could think of as being pulled out of the air and uh, is conducting through to the other side. Uh, these solid oxide fuel cells can be uh, made to be fairly fuel flexible. So in this case you see there's a uh, carbon monoxide, there could be carbon monoxide or methane being used as fuel directly on the anode of these fuel cells. Another uh, fuel that's high temperature and fairly um, forgiving as or flexible as far as what type of fuel goes to it is the molten carbonate fuel cell. And so here it's um, somewhat like the salt oxide fuel cell except for you actually need to supply carbon dioxide to the to the cathode because at the cathode what's occurring is carbon dioxide and oxygen are forming the carbonate ion and that carbonate ion is being conducted through the electrolyte where it combines with hydrogen at the anode so you can see there's a you're, you're pulling CO2 from one side to the other and uh, for this to work efficiently there needs to be a fair amount of carbon dioxide in the cathode airstream so a lot of times what happens in these type of fuel cells is you'll have the fuel go through the anode and then after it goes through the anode you'll combust it with air and then have that have that air go through um, the cathode so that there's a fair amount of carbon dioxide in it so here, here's a summary. This is actually from the fuel cell handbook. Uh, you can go down and download it um, if you haven't already. And instead of going through everything here, it's pretty much well. It's it's a very good summary. Um, so this, I'll just um, have you guys take a look at this on your own, and then we'll move forward. And so what we we'll do now is we're going to start uh, doing a little bit of review of electricity. And, and then we're going to start going into how do we actually calculate the open circuit voltage of fuel cells. Okay, so remember, so work was gonna, is equal to the charge times the voltage difference that that charge goes through. So the voltage, it's an electrical potential. You can think of it as the marginal work required for a unit of charge to go from the anode to the gap the cathode. It, it's, it has to do with the amount of work for a single charge species that we're talking about. That, that would be the voltage and that's why it's called a potential. Like it's, it's a work per charge. And uh, as we saw before and we'll discuss more, we're going to need to know how many electrons are, are generated at electrodes for each amount of fuel. And the other thing we're going to be needing to know is that Faraday's constant. And I have it here. Um, it, it tells you the number of charges in a mole of uh, electrons. Okay. So this is going to chapter one of the, the lecture notes. Just want to make sure everyone has the equations for how you calculate how much flow you need to get a certain current. So let's say we know we need a certain amount of current from a fuel cell. How do we calculate how much flow we need to send in? And um, the answer to that would be the, this is also called Faraday's second law of electrolysis, is that the flow, molar flow rate of fuel that re actually reacts is equal to the current divided by Z times F. Um, and the current you could also put in terms of the area 
total area of the fuel cell times the current density. And uh, once again, so Z, we, we just covered F. That's Faraday's constant. Z is the number of electrons um, per mole of species. So for hydrogen, that's two. And for oxygen, that'd be four. So you could, that's why this uh, equation could be used either to calculate the amount of hydrogen you need or the amount of oxygen you need. And in one case, you can see because Z is equal to four for oxygen, you need half as much oxygen compared to hydrogen. Okay, so now we go on to first what is an open circuit condition and then how do we calculate the voltage. So when, we, when I say open circuit, what I mean is there's no current running through the fuel cell. And so we're flowing hydrogen to the anode and oxygen to the, to the cathode, but none of it's actually reacting. And the reason it's not reacting is that the load is assumed to be an infinite resistor, or what we'll call an open circuit. That the load is such high resistivity, or the, the resistance in the load is so high that you're not actually getting uh, any electrons to go through it. And because the electrons can't go through the electrolyte, nothing's happening. You're just flowing across the anode and flowing across the cathode. So this is what we'll call a constrained non-equilibrium situation. Um, it's constrained, there may be local equilibrium you know, on the anode and local equilibrium in the cathode, but overall it's a very non-equilibrium situation, right? Because there's a huge difference between what's happening in the anode to convert the cathode. But it's constrained. And um, so what will end up happening is that the anode will charge up negatively and the cathode will charge up positively. Right? So you're, stu you're flowing hydrogen and that hydrogen still has the capability of turning into protons and electrons. So th that reaction can occur and so you build up, um, what we'll find out is that you'll start building up electrons at the anode because the protons can actually diffuse through the electrolyte. And uh, those protons can start heading towards the direction of the cathode. Or you can, can think about the other way. Uh, oxygen is already at the cathode. It can grab some electrons. Uh, so it can be removing electro electrons from the electrode. Uh, but what will happen is the electrons can't get from the anode to the cathode. So you don't actually have overall reactions happening. You just set up a situation in which the anode is negative and the cathode is positive. And this is what we this is what we call the open circuit voltage. It's the fact that there is a voltage difference between the anode and cathode. And um, so what we'll find and we'll derive in this next section is even though the voltage is different between the anode and cathode, something is staying constant. And that constant is the electrochemical potential. The electrochemical potential is constant actually throughout the cell. So the electrochemical potential of protons is the same uh, at the anode as it is in the electrolyte light as it is in the cathode when you're in open circuit conditions. Okay, so here's how you derive um, the fact that, the, that there's a constant electrochemical potential. When you start off, so you start off with saying that the current or the current density in the fuel cell is equal to zero. So you know what the current, the current is going to, there's two different forms of current. You could think of the first one as diffusion current. So this is when a, if there's charged species that are diffusing through a concentration gradient, according to Fick's law, that will, could have a net effect, that could draw current, right? Because you have charges diffusing. Now, you can also have charges being conducted through an electric field. So that's what these two terms we have are. We first have it, it's a diffusive term and the second one is a conductive term. Uh, what's nice is that you can use the Einstein relation which relates the conductivity to the diffusivity of a material. Or in this case, the conductivity of protons in the material to the diffusivity of protons in the material. And when you do that, 
you can go down to the you can work out the next equation uh, you'll have to what you'll find is there will be a 1 over C DC um, DX term which you can convert into a DLN of C DX so that's whatever down here and we'll work out on the board and um, so when you do this and if you use the definition of the chemical potential um, the difference in chemical potential between state 1 and state 2 at constant temperature would be RT times the log of concentration in state 1 compared to concentration in state 2. Or the difference in chemical potential between 2 and 1 would be RT log of concentration at 2 divided by concentration at 1. So that's how we've moved to from the the equation just below the Einstein relation to the one be below that. What you find is that the deriv spatial derivative of the following quantity, the chemical potential plus F times Z times the, chem the electrical potential is equal to zero. And what this is saying is that at equilibrium there is no that that the there's no spatial gra the spatial gradient is equal to zero, which means the electrochemical potential of protons is a constant. So once you determine that the electrochemical potential is a constant, you can solve for what the voltage difference would be for a given difference in either if you know the um, difference in the concentration of protons across the anode from the anode and cathode or um, if you can step back and, and if you know what the pressure difference of pr hydrogen is between the anode and cathode. So you can work out the voltage is going to be uh, RT over F Z, RT over FZ times the log of the concentration of protons at the anode compared to the pro uh, concentration of protons at the cathode. Um, but there's going to be a relationship between these which is, should go with um, the pressure of hydrogen at the anode and cathode. So what you can say here is that the voltage difference between the anode and cathode is going to be RT over ZF times the log of the pressure at the anode uh, pressure cathode raised to the one half power. So of course because this is a logarithm what you can do is you can bring that half out and that half right is, will lead to a 2 at the bottom which when you combine um, will turn the Z of, of proton is equal to 1 so that 2 plus times 1 really is, is is equivalent to a Z of 2 so it's like you can turn that into Z of hydrogen so you can see when we were talking about the concentrations of protons we needed to use Z of the protons but if we're going to use P uh, the pressure of hydrogen, the Z is going to be for hydrogen. So, we could have a concentration cell, and this is kind of an interesting thought experiment. On one side of the cell, we could have uh, hydrogen at uh, 100 atmospheres, and on the other side, we could have hi hydrogen at, let's say, 10 to the minus 10, uh, 10 to the minus 8 atmospheres. Um, and you could have an you'll develop an open circuit difference between the anode and cathode in this case. Um, if anode is uh, on the high hydrogen pressure side and cathode is the low hydrogen side. So, because what could happen is you could get work out of this situation. You have a very non-equilibrium situation, high pressure of hydrogen, low pressure, right? You could develop some work based off of this gradient and concentration. So, the the open circuit voltage would be RT over ZF here Z is 2 for hydrogen times the log of the concentration on one side divided by the concentration on the other what you get here is that you'd have a voltage difference of 0.3 volts and um, this is uh, this number is small in comparison to as we'll see throughout this course normally um, open circuit voltage is there on the order of a volt or 1.2 volts or on that order for um, hydrogen powered fuel cells and uh, the reason 
even though you only have one atmosphere of hydrogen coming into the anode, is that because there is oxygen in the cathode, in some ways you can think of the oxygen as keeping that concentration of hydrogen so low. I mean, I think it's on the order of like 10 to the minus 40 atmospheres is, is equivalent of what's it doing. So one way of thinking of it is that oxygen is consuming you know, protons and keeping hydrogen out of the cathode. And so you can think of a fuel cell always as is working similar to a concentration cell in which protons are being conducted from one side to the other and um, because they're being generated on the hydrogen side and consumed on the oxygen side. So the other thing we're going to do is we're going to look at the Nernst potential. And this is the, this will give you the same answer as before if you derive things from a concentration cell. Um, but it's going to be in terms of the Gibbs free energy. And um, so w what we're doing here is um, most of the time let's say you know the pressure of hydrogen and you know the pressure of oxygen. But you, you may not know what the actual pressure of, let's say you, you may know the pressure of hydrogen in the anode and the pressure of oxygen in the cathode. But you may not know the concentration of hydrogen in the, in the cathode or the concentration of oxygen in the anode. So what you can do is you can look up the Gibbs free energy, uh, which is related to the equilibrium constant which will tell you what the equilibrium concentration of hydrogen would be in the cathode in, um, if you have, let's say, um, so much water vapor and so much oxygen. And um, so you can look up what that Gibbs free energy is and you see the equilibrium constant um, is going to be equal to E to the minus G over RT. So you could put, put that equilibrium constant and and the concentrations of, um, which is that equilibrium constant is related to the pressure of oxygen, hydrogen, and water vapor in the cathode. And you could put that into the equation we derived before for what is the voltage of a concentration cell. And what you'll see is the delta G term will come out because you have a logarithm and an E to the delta G of RT. And actually the RT will cancel out with the RT in the equation before. So what you you can do here is there'll be a term that's equal to negative delta G or delta G um, it needs to be negative in order for it to be a spontaneous reaction so a minus a delta G is it's going to be a positive term for anything like a fuel cell um, it w delta G would be negative for if you're doing this um, so delta G would be positive in this the voltage would be negative here if we were doing something like electrolysis where you're trying to produce hydrogen from water. But for in our case, fuel cells, delta G, these are spontaneously occurring, which means you can actually derive voltage from them. So this term is positive. And, um, and you're going to have then a plus RT over 2F. And then you have the logarithm. And this now, you can calculate the open circuit voltage as a function of the pressure of hydrogen in the anode, um, pressure of ca um, in the cathode of oxygen, and the pressure of hydrogen in, in the cathode. And this would be for a PEM fuel cell case. Um, there's generic. There's a generic equation for all for all sorts of fuel cell systems. Um, but we're going to actually go through now and, uh, and show you what that there are subtle differences. Um, so in the PEM case, you saw the pressure of uh, hydrogen here in the denominator. It went as pressure of hydrogen in the cathode. For a salt oxide fuel cell, it goes as the pressure of the hydrogen in the anode, because that's actually where the water is being produced. It's in the anode, being produced in the anode for the salt oxide fuel cell. It's being produced in the cathode for the PEM fuel cell. For the microbial fuel cell, uh, sorry, for the molten carbon fuel cell, um, what you see is in addition to the equation for the salt oxide fuel cell, you also have this ratio of the pressure of the cathode to pressure in the anode. And that's that driving force also. You need some kind of driving force of, um, well, the higher the driving force is between, of CO2 between the cathode and the anode, the more vol open circuit voltage there is. 
and then in that alkaline fuel cell case you can see it gets complicated because there was water being consumed in the anode and produced in, in sorry produced in the anode and consumed in the cathode